Welcome to today's discussion on glaucoma, which is one of my favorite topic. It's a very, very important disease as far as the eye is concerned. And one of the reason is because very few people understand it. Even doctors are getting confused with what glaucoma is. So let's try to answer a lot of those questions in the next few minutes. I want you to listen to this quote from one of the most senior glaucoma specialists, Dave, uh, Dr. David Epstein. He said that in the field of glaucoma, the questions remain the same, but the answers keep changing. Now, what does he mean by that? Now, there was a time um, as far back as early 1900s that uh, glaucoma is diagnosed by just looking at the patient's pupil and asking if the patient can still see. So that's as simple as glaucoma is at the time. And what they're trying to look at, they're, what they're trying to find is something like this. Now, this is what they were looking for. They, they will shine a light either from a candle or from uh, natural sunlight. And they will look at the patient's eye and they will see something like this. Now, that is the reason why glaucoma got its name. It's from the Greek word glaucos, which means bluish green or grayish blue. What they're looking at here is the pupil right now. <clears throat> currently, we know this as a cataract. It's a hypermature cataract. But at the time, with their limited understanding on what glaucoma is, this is glaucoma as far as the ancients are concerned and as far back as the early 1900s the treatment for glaucoma the recommended treatment for glaucoma was the removal of the eyeball now the logic was to save the other eye of course we know um, with our current understanding that this does not work but at the time this was the cutting edge treatment. This was the recommended treatment for glaucoma. And since the time, we have gone a long way in understanding what glaucoma is. We've gone a long way on how we can treat glaucoma and diagnose glaucoma. But for you to be able to understand it because it's so confusing, I want you to remember that glaucoma is not a single disease entity. It's not like um, a, a single disease that uh, will, will present with a specific set of symptoms, with a specific set of signs, and then you can diagnose and then treat it later on. Glaucoma is basically like a group of diseases. Now, I want you to think of it as like fever. When a patient has fever, it doesn't mean he has this particular disease. It could be an infection. It could be from dehydration. It could be from anything. It could be from an inflammation, whether infection or otherwise. So glaucoma is similar. It's not a single disease entity. It's basically a group of progressive neurodegenerative disease of the eye. Now, I want you to take particular attention to the word progressive because glaucoma, if it is indeed glaucoma and you ignore it and come back to the same patient after about 5 years, 10 years, it should have gotten worse. If it's still exactly the same after 10 years, after 20 years, then you're probably not dealing with glaucoma and you're dealing with something else. It's neurodegenerative. Basically, it's a disease of the optic nerve. Okay, so I want you to understand that uh, <clears throat> um, in glaucoma, there is death of the retinal ganglion cells, which produces a characteristic optic neuropathy and visual field defect. Okay, we highlighted optic neuropathy and visual field defect because clinically speaking, that is what you look for. But the mechanics of glaucoma is that the retinal ganglion cells start to die off. So it, you, you see that in the optic nerve 
and in the visual field of the patient. Now, this is how a characteristic optic neuropathy should look like. Now, a lot of problems may present as glaucoma or you may mistake as glaucoma, but usually they will, <clears throat> they will exhibit a different type of optic neuropathy. The, their optic nerve could be milder, it, it could be pale, that means you're probably during, uh, dealing with neuritis instead of glaucoma. But the optic neuropathy of glaucoma usually has very, very similar symptoms. Okay, we'll <clears throat> show you later on uh, a, a few examples of those. And it has a corresponding visual field loss. Those, so this is a visual field um, printout which shows you a very typical uh, problem with glaucoma. You notice it did not attack the center of the vision first. It usually destroys the peripheral vision first, usually. So a lot of patients are surprised that they already have a problem because as far as people are concerned when they look at something and they can still see it then they don't have any problem glaucoma goes around that by destroying the things that you don't notice first and takes the center of your vision last now for example if this is how a normal scene would look like from somebody who's enjoying the sunset and for a patient with glaucoma, it would look something like this. Now, <clears throat> what throws off a lot of people is that when they look at something, they usually expect it to be, uh, to be clear. And in such a, in, uh, if that should happen, then they are usually happy. Glaucoma attacks the areas at the periphery. Okay, so what's the periphery? Periphery is when you're looking, the peripheral vision is when you're looking at the person's face, when you're talking to somebody, you're looking at the person's face, that's your central vision. But even though you're, pa you're looking at your patient's face, you can also see w the color of the clothes. They can, you can see the people that are uh, standing beside the, your patient. Or if your patient is wearing a very tall hat, you can actually even see that hat with your peripheral vision. However, your central vision is actually your strongest your best vision and uh, if your peripheral vision gets destroyed usually glaucoma goes after the central vision next so i want you to take note that is not in the definition okay it is not in the definition intraocular pressure it is not part of the definition of glaucoma usually a lot of doctors or even patients mistake that glaucoma comes hand in hand with an increased eye pressure okay that's not true anymore because we've seen a lot of cases with glaucoma whose pressures are now considered in the normal range now intraocular pressure although it's not part of the definition it's a risk factor and it's the most important risk factor the reason for that, it is the only risk factor that we can target and modify for glaucoma treatment. It's the only target for glaucoma treatment. We are medications that are designed to treat glaucoma. The surgery that was designed to treat glaucoma are all designed to bring down the intraocular pressure. So, if we need to, if we're going to treat glaucoma and pre intraocular pressure is the only treatable uh, risk factor or modifiable factor, then we need to understand how to control the intraocular pressure. And to understand the intraocular pressure, we have to understand the balance of the aqueous humor. The aqueous humor is basically the fluid inside the eye that determines your intraocular pressure the production of the intra of the aqueous humor should equal the drainage of the uh, aqueous humor if you have if you're producing too much then your pressure will increase and if your drainage becomes clogged then you also will have an increase 
in the pressure of the eye because of accumulation of the aqueous humor. Now, um, <clears throat> the aqueous humor, it's very, very important. So what is it? The aqueous humor is the fluid. It's a clear fluid, intraocular fluid inside your eye. And it's similar to the blood plasma, but it has low protein. It doesn't. Ha it's like your blood, but without the RBCs, and very very little protein because those proteins will be will actually make your eye make your vision blurry. And the AQ humor is not just there, um, like a river that's flowing. It actually nourishes the inside of the eye. And it inflates the eye. So without your AQ humor, your eye actually collapses. It becomes deformed. And if you have the proper pressure of the AQ humor, then your eye will have its proper shape. Now, AQ humor is composed of amino acids, electrolytes, ascorbic acid, glutathione, immunoglobulins, but it's 98% water. Okay, so just by looking at what's in it, you know that it's very important in the defense of the eye, not just in the nutrition. It has immunoglobulins and it has the ascor uh, ascorbic acid and glutathione basically as antioxidants for the inside of your eye. So imagine if you don't have a clear aqueous humor and you have blood doing the same work as the aqueous humor, then you won't see anything. All you'll see is red. Now, the AQ humor doesn't fill the entire eye, just the front part of the eye. And this is where the nitty-gritty of the AQ humor comes from. The green arrows that you can see here is the flow of the AQ humor, the normal flow. It's produced from the ciliary, uh, ciliary processes, travels in front of the lens and into the anterior chamber, and out on the red arrow, uh, in this case, the one in number five, through the trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, the collector channel, and out through the episcleral vein, returning it to your normal circulation to be refilled, to be uh, to be charged again with nutrition, with oxygen, with all those uh, amino acids, and returned inside the eye full of nutrition again. But it has also other drainage. Those are the purple lines. <clears throat> so what produces your aqueous humor? So the primary function of the ciliary process is the production of the aqueous humor. So it's produced in the ciliary process and this is the micro electron, electron microscope uh, picture of a ciliary process. Um, those are the long lines that you can see on top. They produce the fluids that not, uh, that is uh, nourishing your eye. And it does so with a very, very rich vasculature. <clears throat> uh, part of it is the uh, major arterial circle of the iris. And um, <clears throat> basically the choroidal vessels and the posterior ciliary ar artery both join to create the major arterial circle of the iris where your blood uh, where your ciliary processes get their blood supply and from this they release the serum into your eye the exit is from the iris veins the ciliary process and the ciliary muscles all go through the choroidal veins so this is how your aqueous <clears throat> humor is produced from the ciliary processes. But I, uh, what I want you to remember from this picture is the rate of the aqueous humor formation, which is approximately 3 microliters per minute. So it's very, very small. But it's also crucial that your drainage should actually be around 3 mic uh, micro, um, micrometer, uh, microliters per Per minute also otherwise if it's draining too slowly then you will have an accumulation of fluid inside the eye and you'll have an increase in pressure now 
it's produced by a mixture of ultrafiltration and active secretion from the ciliary processes and <clears throat> it's drained in this uh, we, well we we labeled it with the red arrows so the drainage is going through the trabecular meshwork through the cornea through the lens through the ciliary process and through the <clears throat> sorry uh, not through the ciliary process but through the vitreous and through your sclera so you have five major um exit pathways for your um, aqueous humor but the two most important and the two most are responsible for the drainage is through the trabecular meshwork and the uveoscleral pathway but the uveoscleral pathway is around 15 20 percent most of it would be through the trabecular meshwork so this is how your trabecular meshwork looks like. This is a gonioscopic picture. Looking at the trabecular meshwork, it's where your white part of the eye is meeting the colored part of the eye. <clears throat> and the trabecular meshwork here is that blue, uh, sorry, brown lining that you see on top of that very, very uh, brown iris. Now, this is how a trabecular meshwork looks like in an electron microscope. Microscope. It's basically a mesh. It's like a drain. Uh, it's like a screen for a drain that uh, it's designed to, remo uh, to prevent any large materials from clogging the, uh, the drainage, much like your screen in your sink um, catches all those large debris. Now, this is an illustration of how it actually looks from a larger screen from uh, we call the uvula scleral mes uh, meshwork then a smaller screen we call it the corneal scleral meshwork and then very very fine into the juxtacanalicular meshwork and into the inner lining of your Schlem's canal now if you notice the inner lining does not have any fenestration it goes through um, it goes through uh, a different pathway by not just by simply flowing through but a more active uh, process now <clears throat> i want you to understand uh, that glaucoma isn't um, like an infection you get glaucoma in five days you're blind or you get a glaucoma in five days you have a fever and you have all the symptoms and then you have you have a resolution in another five to uh, five days to a week. Glaucoma is something that happens for a long, long time. But very important, the glaucoma continuum il illustrates that from the normal to the to the pi to the time that you become blind takes a long, long time. So the one on the left would be the, the disease would still be undetectable. The one in the center the disease would still be asymptomatic but already detectable and one on your right side that uh, the function uh, <clears throat> there's a functional disturbance now you can actually see that there's a problem and usually this is when patients start going to hospitals okay <clears throat> according to this um, table by dr weinreib um, uh, way back in 2004 i want you to take a notice of this area it is the first time that glaucoma could be detected in a patient but if you notice the label on top it's still asymptomatic glaucoma can be detected but there will be no symptoms yet and so far what we have here to detect uh, those um, those problems is called an OCT. We'll talk about that later. But the next part is when the visual field starts to change and the damage is already moderate. Not an early damage, but moderate damage. It's only at the time where you will notice that you actually have problems in your vision. And this is the time that patients usually rush to the hospital to see their doctor, to, uh, to have their eyes checked because they now notice that something is wrong. And notice how 
short the time is between that time and the time that you can go into total complete blindness. So the best advice I could give you from uh, from this uh, uh, illustration is that don't wait for your symptoms to appear before you see a doctor. Advise your patients, see the doctor when your vision, you feel your vision is still very, very good. Glaucoma is a very, very important disease for the following reasons. One, it affects 2% of the world population and it's the leading cause of blindness in the world, especially in developed countries. In non-developed or developing countries like ours, glaucoma would be either be second or third in the leading cause of blindness. In the Philippines, it's number three. In the, uh, in the developed countries, it's usually either number one or number two. And as I said, it affects roughly about 2% of the world population. And of that 2%, practically 10% of that are blind. Now, glaucoma is mostly hereditary. It goes with an autosomal dominant pattern. Remember? Autosomal dominant. Because if you have a you if you if your father or mother have glaucoma then the possibility of your siblings or your or your um uh children also have will also have glaucoma is very very high almost 9 times higher but not everybody will have glaucoma it's an autosomal dominant it's not 100% most may have it, as I said, 9% higher risk than a person without any relatives with glaucoma. And one, um, one thing we notice is almost half of our patients with glaucoma have relatives also with glaucoma. And the older you get, the more likely you will have glaucoma. But there's a caveat. You, uh, if you're not yet an elder an elderly, if you're not yet a senior citizen, you're not that safe either. So usually your sickliness or your wellness comes into play. If you're an elderly with a lot of problems like diabetes, hypertension, then your likelihood to have glaucoma is higher. If you're young, but you're also sickly, you also have diabetes, you have uh, hypertension, then your risk of having glaucoma would also be higher than your peers. Now let's talk about other major factors, risk factors, aside from the most important, which is intraocular pressure. One is family history. We said again, nine times higher because of our hereditary uh, reasons. Now race is very important because Eskimos and the Blacks are more prone to having uh, open angle type of glaucoma and Asians are more prone to having closed angle type of glaucoma. And as I said earlier, increasing age makes you more vulnerable to having glaucoma. Other risk factors that we've no also noticed, if you're firesighted, you may have uh, you're more prone to angle closure glaucoma, and if you're nearsighted or myopic, you're now more prone to an open angle type of glaucoma. Other things that we've noticed is that thin corneas also produce uh, a higher risk of having glaucomas. Intakes of uh, intake of steroids or medication uh, or steroid-like substances would also increase your risk factors. The longer you're taking steroids, the higher your, your risk of developing glaucoma and eye surgery because in eye surgery, you've actually modified the natural structure of your eye. So that, that might um, interfere with the normal flow of AQs inside your eye. Other risk factors that is very very important don't forget again is the elevated intraocular pressure which is our only modifiable risk factor we cannot modify your age 
We cannot modify your race or your family, but we can control your intraocular pressure. Now, let's talk about the types of glaucoma, not just for academic purposes because uh, the types of glaucoma is very important because it determines the direction of your treatment. You treat an, uh, one type of glaucoma totally different if it's a to if it's another type of glaucoma there are two major ones open angle glaucoma wherein when you look inside the eye there's nothing blocking the tra trabecular meshwork it's just not working so something is interfering with the drainage although you can see everything is uh, in place but the pressure is still going up it's called an open angle glaucoma and in open angle glaucoma in the early stages there are no symptoms okay no symptoms whatsoever if you google or consult the internet or you're very very um techy and prefer to uh, consult with dr google than your regular doctor then they will tell you that glaucoma has the following symptoms eye redness eye pain blurring of vision uh, halos around the light and a very hard eyeball now I want to tell you very very frankly this um, this belief is actually one of the reasons why a lot of people went blind with glaucoma because they think if you don't have those symptoms you don't have glaucoma you have those symptoms of glaucoma only when your glaucoma is either moderate or already severe so a lot of people are waiting for those symptoms. They say, don't, I don't have glaucoma because I don't have those symptoms. And those symptoms will appear in glaucoma only when it's very late. Okay, so don't wait for, this, um, for uh, glaucoma to produce those symptoms before you have it treated. Now the other type is closed angle glaucoma. When you look inside the eye, you cannot see the trabecular meshwork because the iris is blocking it. So the drainage cannot go, um, cannot continue because the fluid, the aqueous uh, humor, cannot go out of the trabecular meshwork because something is blocking the trabecular meshwork. If you like an ex uh, the the example of the table uh, of the sink, when you have a sink and you put a plate on top of the drainage, then you will have um, an overflow in your sink it's because something is blocking the drainage and in closed angle glaucoma something is blocking your drainage and you need to treat that for your flu uh, for your flow to re-establish now closed angle glaucoma has the following symptoms it's it has blurred vision it has eye pain it has headaches usually one-sided only on the side where the angle has closed there's nausea and vomiting, and there's iridescent vision. There, when you look at the uh, at the light, there is a rainbow ar around the light. It has to be colored. If it's white, then you're probably dealing with an error of refraction rather than an increase in intraocular pressure. Now, there's also a caveat to this, because in closed angle glaucoma, you don't wait for the angle to close. These symptoms will happen when the angles close. But we have the technology, we have the skill to detect if your angles are um, prone to closing or nearly closed. So we don't have to wait until the angle closes before we can treat you. We can treat you earlier than that and it's really easier to treat a patient with closed angle glaucoma when the angle has not yet fully closed or it has not closed permanently yet okay so again don't wait for your problems to be severe or to be significant enough before you have your eyes checked so let's talk about how to diagnose glaucoma the easiest is checking the intraocular pressure of everybody now we've uh, realized that that is not true when uh, you screen for glaucoma in patients where they don't have problems yet and you just rely on the eye pressure it is not sufficient to detect glaucoma for closed angle glaucoma the angle hasn't closed yet or the angle has 
closed but reopened temporarily, pressure will be normal. Uh, in an open angle glaucoma, pressure might not have reached that um, that uh, that point wherein it's already past um, norm uh, the normal. Again. Um, you will miss those cases. And more importantly, there are now cases wherein we detected uh, what we call low tension glaucoma or normal tension glaucoma, wherein the pressures are not that high, but the, uh, the eye is already exhibiting signs of glaucoma. So there are various reasons aside from the intraocular pressure that causes those problems. So pressure is not the only determinant. But it's very useful and it's the most and only modifiable risk factor. Now, you need to undergo a complete and regular eye exam. Check your patients. Make sure you have a dilated eye exam and see the optic nerve. How, uh, going to a doctor and just having your glasses made is not a complete eye exam. Have your optic nerve checked. And um, to, to summarize what a regular and complete eye exam includes, it's an evaluation of the optic nerve and checking the pressure of the patient's eye. Now, again, don't just have an exam once in your lifetime. Have a regular eye exam for the same reason that you don't go to your barber or your hairdresser just once in your life. You go to them regularly. You don't go to your dentist just once in your life. You go to them regularly. You don't visit your ob um, patient, uh, your ob doctor just once in your life. You visit them regularly. And so that you should also see your eye doctor regularly. Now, the way we check the uh, optic nerve is through a process we call ophthalmoscopy. Uh, we use an ophthalmoscope to check inside the eye, but that is not the only way to be able to examine the optic nerve. You could also use a slit lamp with a um, 90D, 90D or a super field lens so you can check the patient in a more comfortable way. Or you can have an ophthalmoscope and uh, directly check the, your patient's optic nerve. Now, the difference is the... Uh, slit lamp lenses will give you a wider field but a smaller image and the direct ophthalmoscope will give you a uh, a smaller image uh, a smaller field but a very very enlarged image now this is what you will find if you look into your patient's op uh, in patient's eye and check their optic nerve the normal would be on the left the glaucomatous would be on the right. Again, it looks similar to um, our picture before. It's actually an excavated uh, optic nerve. If it looks like <clears throat> uh, your optic nerve on the left, but it's just pale, it's not pink, it's pale, then you probably are dealing with optic neuritis and not glaucoma. Now, as glaucoma progresses, it enlarges. So when you see a patient now and you see uh, the patient in 5 years or 10 years, they would have a progression if you did not intervene. So uh, it depends now on when you caught that patient. So the patient could have had an examination uh, early on and had a normal exam and then the patient was happy because they found that their eyes are normal, they don't have glaucoma because their optic nerve is still very good. But They've never gone back to a doctor and saw another doctor after 20 years, 30 years, and then got shocked because they were told that they have severe glaucoma already because glaucoma progresses. This is the side view. That was the front view. This is the side view of the, the same optic nerve. And you can see the excavation. This is an uh, electron microscope uh, examination of patients with glaucoma. So this is a, you can see the excavation uh, inside, not just, it's actually wider. They call it the bin pot uh, morphology because it looks like a pot and not just a very, very uh, clear cut cylinder uh, because you, you lose some parts of your nerves 
uh, and usually they're not just what you can see straight on. You're also looking for other signs because you cannot dissect all of your patients, especially if they're still alive. So you're looking for signs. You're looking for things like the bio, uh, bio netting, which is uh, indicated here by the arrow. You notice the Z formation of your op uh, of the blood vessel. It's because the nerve that was support the nerves that was supporting your blood vessel disappeared or died off. So the blood vessel now is conforming with the new uh, shape of the uh, optic uh, optic disc, which is excavated at the interior. You can also see notching. That means part of your optic nerve would still be okay. Part of your optic nerve would be very thin. In this case, remember the arrow, it's pointing to that sliver of pink line. Uh, that white, white band underneath the tip of the arrow is not part of your optic nerve. It's part of your retina. It's called the peri... Uh, that phenomenon is called the peripapillary atrophy. The nerve is actually that small dark red band that the arrow is pointing to that is what's left of the optic nerve on the inferior but if you notice the, the superior rim is still very very healthy you're also looking for disc hemorrhage that means whatever your pressure is uh, that the, that you're getting whatever your med that wh whatever your patient's medication uh, is it's not enough that means the glaucoma is still progressing and that is the reason why you should visit your doctor regularly this disc hemorrhage is an indication for at whatever you're doing it's not enough you need to be a little more aggressive you need to add more medications or you need to adapt a different approach and this hemorrhage will disappear in about uh, three to four months so if you don't really go to your doctor regularly, they will miss this and think everything is okay and get surprised in about 5 years to 10 years because your vision is really deteriorating despite all the medications because they missed the disc hemorrhage because you did not go to, uh, and see them regularly. Again, aside from just taking the uh, looking at the optic nerve, we need to take the pressure of the eye. There are two types of tonometry. We either indent the eye, the more in the more uh, energy we need to indent the eye, the higher the pressure, or we flatten the eye. The more pre the more energy we need, the more the, the more weight we need to flatten the part of the eye, the higher the pressure is. So we call the one that the first one indentation and the second one Applanation tonometry. The gold standard for tonometry is the Goldman Applanation Tonometer. Okay, so in case you get into an exam and get asked what's the gold standard for taking the, ton the uh, eye pressure, you look for the same choice with the word gold. Goldman, gold standard. Now, this is how a Goldman tonometer looks like it's a Hagstrite uh, tonometer. The one on the left is the digital. The one on the right is a manual. Both of them are actually mounted on a slit lamp. Um, that's why it's bulky. And since it's mounted on a slit lamp, you can only do this if your patient is sitting down or standing up. You cannot do this when your patient is lying down um, or cannot sit up. And what you're looking for is the small blue square on top, which is, uh, you, and you see some half, uh, illuminated green um, half circles you need to touch you it, well you need to <clears throat> to turn the dial and whenever the inner lip of the upper half touches the inner lip of the lower half the inner lips okay not the entire that the entire uh, half circle the inner lips once they touch that is the pressure of your eye now we have had some modifications now this is the perkins tonometer which is more portable and you can uh, do this even if your patient is lying down this one is an indentation tonometer it's a shot tonometer um, i believe this is the cheapest of all the tonometers available it's handheld and that bar on your right is uh, actually attached inside the machine and that's what you use 
to indent the eye and check for the pressure of your, uh, your patient's eye. This one is a tono pen, which is an electronic machine, uh, electronic um, equipment. It's very, very expensive. And you can do this even your patient is lying down, sitting up, or standing up. Most of the eye centers or large hospitals will have an air puff tonometer. It's a non-touch tonometer, which is um, good if your patient uh, doesn't want their eyes being touched or manipulated. It will blow a puff of air to check the pressure of your uh, patient's eye. Unfortunately, some patients don't really like getting wind blown into their uh, in the eye. It's like um, it's a sensitive uh, reaction on their part. But it's non-touch, so it has problems, uh, especially during the time of COVID, because COVID has been known to be transmitted not just by uh, droplets, but also by tears. And blowing a puff of air um, may save you from touching the patient, but theoretically, it might aerosolize uh, the tears and theoretically, again, spread COVID. Again, that's theoretical it has never been proven this is called a rebound tonometer um, i think i care has uh, this particular machine they're trying to modify it so you can actually get one and uh, measure your own uh, eye pressure at home it will uh, rebound the the probe which is on your lower left uh, it will bounce it on top of the eye and check the pressure uh, of your eye it's a consumable that means you really need to replace it ev uh, after every use but your eye doesn't feel it so you don't need, need to anesthetize your patient's eye before uh, when you use uh, a rebound tonometer so this is one is a trigger fish tonometer which is basically a contact lens with um, uh, with circuitry it's designed to measure the pressure of your eye on a 24 hour basis so even when you're sleeping the pressure of your eye can be checked but it's still very bulky i think it's still in the infancy stage because uh, it's very very bulky aside from the um the the circuitry that you can see in the contact lenses your eye would also be taped with a lot of electrical circuits for them to get the signal of the contact lens now Gonioscopy is how you look at the op, uh, at, at the angle, the trabecular meshwork, the drainage. So basically, you use this to um, to inspect their pa the the drainage of your patient's eye again because it will tell you what directions you can do. Uh, you you will need to go in the treatment of your patient's eye. So you have picture. Um, you have some of the lenses that are used on the left, and the picture on the right is what you will see when you look inside one of those lenses now uh, this is how the uh, it will look like you're supposed to ignore the image in the middle and just look at the mirrors on the side to have a to have a glimpse of how the angles look okay remember it's it's a mirror so what's on your left is actually on the patient's right what's up is actually down so just remember that when you're looking through the gonioscope now you need the gonio lens to be able to see the angles because the natural curvature of your eye will divert any light towards the pupil and away from your angle so if you want to see the trabecular meshwork or the angles you cannot just try to look at the sides of your patient's eye to see it you will need to have a lens that will go against the natural curvature of the eye for it to show you the angles now <clears throat> um, your assessment for glaucoma is not just the optic nerve your optic nerve uh, has a problem you can see it but your uh, one of the part of the definition is perimetry you need to be sure you of the visual field of your patient's eye so this uh, in the picture is an automated perimeter so the machine does the exams the machine tests if you're trying to cheat the patient uh, the the machine will actually do the entire exam for you which used to take about half an hour to an hour depending on the skill of the technician but this machine will be able to finish an exam 
from between 3 minutes in the screening modes to as uh, as long as um, 5 to 15 minutes in the more dynamic modes and they will produce an ex a result similar to the one on your right and the, it will produce a, a printout and depending on the pattern in this example this is an early glaucoma pattern you will be able to determine if the patient has problems with their peripheral vision in this case the patient did not even know that they have already problems in the peripheral vision um, but the exam is showing that there's an early glaucomatous pattern and the worse your visual field becomes your optic nerve should also show the same problem or vice versa if you look at the optic nerve and it's getting worse and then checking the visual field it should also reflect what you see in your optic nerve so the worse the optic nerve looks the worse your visual field looks if your visual field is so bad but your optic nerve doesn't really show that type of severity then you might be dealing with a different problem which basically just looks like glaucoma so this the anatomy should always coincide with functionality we can now use an optical coherence to a tomograph to examine the eye not just how it looks but it can go deeper it can actually examine the layers of your retina determine if your retinal nerve fiber layer is actually thinning out uh, it can also examine the front part of the eye it could scan the angles it could scan the thickness of your uh, cornea remember one of our risk factors is a thin cornea and be able to show you progression if this is done repeatedly okay so enough with how to diagnose let's talk about how to treat patients with glaucoma now in treating patients with glaucoma the number one target would be to reduce the eye pressure you need to bring down the pressure of your patient's eye that's the number one uh, target for all our eye drops especially eye drops is to remove the increase in pressure okay so why do we want to reduce the eye pressure it's because we want to slow down the optic nerve damage which is basically the main uh, the main definition of glaucoma and we're doing that because we want the patient to have very good visual fields and we want to have good visual fields because patients who can see well will have a better quality of life than a patient who was either blind or nearly blind so treatment of the glaucoma depends on the type of glaucoma open angle closed angle or one of the subspecifics of those two and the severity of the glaucoma you don't treat an early glaucoma very very aggressively and you don't treat a severe glaucoma with a very very conservative approach so um, you need to balance the severity with how aggressive you are and the type of glaucoma uh, with your uh, options in the treatment again as I said earlier there's only one treatable risk factor the intraocular pressure and what it does to your eye which is it damages the most sensitive part inside the eye your optic nerve so or our drugs all our eye drops especially the tablets for glaucoma are all designed to lower eye pressure now when we treat glaucoma we want to prevent vision loss because nerve loss especially the optic nerve because it's part of the central nervous system is permanent your optic nerve does not regenerate you cannot take a tablet or drink a fruit or eat a berry and expect your optic nerve to grow again so instead of waiting for your glaucoma to become severe save your optic nerve by having it treated early and save as much of your optic nerve as much as possible and we have three types of treatment for glaucoma one we have eye drops and oral medications we have lasers and we have surgery before the 
progression with open angle glaucoma is we give them medications first, laser next, and surgery uh, later on. With closed angle glaucoma, the approach becomes more of laser first and then surgery next. We don't really have that much of a reliance on medications when we're treating closed angle glaucoma. So uh, we, we do with lasers and surgery. But nowadays with the improvement in the lasers, um, in open type of glaucoma, we can now do lasers um, before medications or along with medications. We don't wait for the medications to run off before we start with lasers. We can even do lasers first or do uh, lasers along with medications. Now, you need to be careful when you're using medications. We have a lot of medications right now. When we started um, 20, 30 years ago, uh, we practically have only two working medications for glaucoma, two eye drops, commercially available eye drops. And now we have more than a dozen and more are coming in. More classes are getting developed uh, for, uh, for anti-glaucoma medications, but with those medications come complications. The more medications you use, the more complications you will need to deal with. And the more classes of medications you use, the more the varied your complications will become. So you need to be aware of what the complications are whenever you give any medications. Don't just give a medication because you think it's part of the menu when you're dealing with glaucoma. Be sure to also know what the complications are and if they will affect your patients. There are cases wherein patients are uh, died because of complications cre uh, created by uh, by your anti-glaucoma medication. So be careful. Just be sure you know what um, what the complications are before you give these medications. Uh, and before we move on, I uh, also want to mention that um, preservative-free uh, anti-glaucoma medications are usually better than preservative-laden glaucoma medications. The more preservatives there are, the more complications you may expect from the patients. So it's not the active ingredient that may be causing the problem, it's the preservatives. So preservative-free, if you have access to those types of medications, use them over the non-preservative medications. Okay, so in lasers, uh, we have some approaches. For example, this is called a laser iridotomy. It creates another opening because the blockage for uh, closed angle glaucoma is usually in between the lens and the iris so creating another opening to bypass the iris uh, to bypass the pupil should create uh, should ease off the pressure building up behind the iris and pushing it forward so you use a laser iridotomy in cases of angle closure or you're suspecting the patient will have angle closure in the near future called an, a narrowed angle um, this is an irid a laser iridoplasty. The laser iridoplasty are the white spots that you see at the sides. It's not the black spot. That's an, irid uh, that's an iridotomy that we showed you before. The white spots are laser iridoplasty. They're designed to contract that area and to flatten that area. Usually designed to either augment your laser iridotomy or to treat your patient uh, if they, if you're suspecting them or think that they have um, a plateau iris syndrome. Now, there are other lasers, for example, the SLT, the uh, Selective Laser Trabeculoplasty, which is now used uh, primarily for open-angle glaucoma. It's so effective that you may be able to use it before you, um, you even start eye drops. Okay, so now moving into surgery. Um, trabeculi, tra, uh, trabeculo, uh, trabeculectomy basically bypasses the trabecular meshwork. You create a bypass, like a heart bypass, but you don't do it, do it in the heart, you do it in the eye. You create a bypass because the trabecular meshwork is not um, functioning. Either it's uh, a primary problem like an open angle, glau uh, open angle glaucoma case, or it could be a closed angle case, so you will need to bypass it. And a trabeculectomy actually uses the subtenons area to create uh, another space for that fluid 
to go in. It doesn't flow outside of the eye, it's still inside the eye, but now it's now uh, trapped underneath the trabecular measure, uh, the, the subtenon space wherein the blood vessels in the episclera could bring that uh, fluid back into circulation. You could also use a tube surgery, which is a little more invasive because you need to implant a large tube. Actually, the tube is small, but the 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 valve or the body of the the tube is larger if you place it behind the eye and the tube is the one in front of the eye we usually reserve this for more difficult glaucoma cases or for glaucomas in children but aside from those um interventions you could also do some lifestyle modification it's important to modify this because sometimes you've done everything that you can do but still uh, the glaucoma seems to be progressing your patient seems to be progressing so usually it's because of the next few reasons patients with these problems usually are more of a risk for progression they have glaucoma but it's getting worse and it's it keeps on getting worse Despite your medications, despite your interventions, despite whatever you give the patient, they're still getting worse. Usually, if your patient um, cannot manage their own life, usually we define this as the patient cannot even put his own eye drops on himself. They're reliant on somebody else to take care of them. Or as, as something as simple as they cannot take a bath on their own, they cannot move on their own. So these patients tend to have a faster and more pronounced progression compared with others. Also, if your patient has hypotension, vasospasm, or anemia, they seem to be progressing even though you can control the eye pressure. Again, I mentioned it's not just the eye pressure. Sometimes there are other factors, and one of them is the micro microvasculature, the circulation that is feeding your optic nerve. It might not be enough. So if your patient is hypotensive or having vasospasm or anemic, that might explain why your pressure is low, but your glaucoma is still progressing. Also, we noted that patients with obesity, with sedentary lifestyle, or are more nourished, tend to progress more than peers who don't have these problems. There are some activities that may worsen glaucoma. Now, now these are usually very specific. For example, if you have a pigment dispersion glaucoma, wherein pigments are actually from the iris are actually floating inside the eye. Exercise that requires you to shake the, shake the head, for example, jumping jacks. Um, these exercises will actually shake more of those iris pigments free and they get trapped in your trabecular meshwork, increasing your eye pressure. So no exercise that involves shaking the head now deep sea diving because of the pressure again regular swimming is not that uh, it's not uh, that uh, it's not forbidden but deep sea diving increases the pressure not of your and not just in your eye but also in your entire body even your i think even your blood pressure and your intracranial pressure now trauma through contact sports may worsen your glaucoma because trauma might produce some inflammation or damage, uh, organic damage inside the eye. Sex has also been known to cause specific, uh, to worsen specific types of glaucoma, spe uh, especially the narrow angle or, or the closed angle types of glaucoma. <clears throat> now these activities, we don't have that much evidence against them, but there are some journals already that are saying that these are actually uh, making your glaucoma worse. Alcohol consumption, cigarette smoking, and exposure to heavy metal are really advised to be avoided whenever you have glaucoma. We don't have that much uh, evidence, but there are already journals, one or two journals, that are saying or pointing to these problems as possible causes of worsening of your glaucoma. Because um, we want you to remember that in glaucoma, when vision is lost, it is lost forever. Your optic nerve does not regenerate. Once the damage that get that it gets, it cannot um, it cannot repair. You cannot re revive an optic nerve that's already dead. However, you can still save an optic nerve who's just damaged, 
or just in the throes. But if it's dead, you cannot bring it back to life. So thank you, and if you have any comments or questions, don't remember, uh, don't forget to place them in the comment section. Thank you very much.